everyone, what's going on? Now, at this stage of Flask video series, we have played with a basic Flask application. You might want to know more about how Flask works its magic. So in this video, we are going to explore the request response cycle. It's really important to understand how Flask takes the request and gives the response back and what happens between these stages. So we will talk about application and request contacts, request dispatching, and the response object. Let's start with the big picture of request and response in Flask. So first, a client makes a request to the Flask server. When Flask receives a request from a client, it needs to make a few objects available to the view function that will handle it. A good example is the request object which encapsulates the HTTP request sent by the client. The obvious way in which Flask could give a view function access to the request object is by sending it as an argument. But that would require every single view function in the application to have an extra argument. Things get more complicated if you consider that the request object is not the only object that view functions might need to access to fulfill a request. But this issue can be solved in the Flask. We will take a look shortly. So when Flask invokes a view function, it expects its return value to be the response to the request. In most cases, the response is a simple string that is sent back to the client as an HTML page and this cycle goes on. That's the big picture of request response cycle in Flask. Let's dive a little bit deeper to explore these components in a more detailed way. So we will look at the request part of this process. Let's talk about the application and request context. As we talked about a solution to provide view function access to the request object by passing it as an argument. But if the request object is not the only object that view functions might need to access to fulfill a request, then we have to pass multiple extra arguments to view functions. So it becomes more complicated. But what's the solution? To avoid cluttering view functions with lots of arguments that may not always be needed, Flask uses context to temporarily make certain objects globally accessible. With context, view functions like the following one can be written. You can see how request is used as if it were a global variable. In reality, request cannot be a global variable. In a multi-threaded server, several threads can be working on different requests from different clients all at the same time. So each thread needs to see a different object in request. Contacts enable Flask to make certain variables globally accessible to a thread without interfering with the other threads. If you don't know about what is a thread, and how multi-threading works in Python, watch this amazing video. Okay, so now let's talk about this context. There are two contexts in Flask, the application context and the request context. Two variables are available in the application context. The first one is the current underscore app, which is actually an instance of the active application. And the second one is G, which is an object that the application can use for temporary storage during the handling of a request and this variable is reset with each request. Similarly, the request context also has two variables. The first one is the request, which is the actual request context and it encapsulates the contents of an HTTP request sent by the client. And the second one is the session, which is a dictionary that the application can use to store values that are remembered between the requests. But how do these contacts work? Flask activates the application and request contacts before dispatching a request to the application and removes them after the request is handled. When the application context is pushed, the current underscore app and G variables become available to the thread. Likewise, when the request context is pushed, requests and sessions become available as well. If any of these variables are accessed without an active application or request context, an error is generated. Let me show you how it works in code. 
So inside the Python interpreter, I will import my Flask application as from app import app. Then I will import current underscore app from the Flask. And now, if we try to get the name of this application as current underscore app dot name, it will raise an error because we haven't pushed the application context as it suggests here. So now I will call the app underscore context method for this application and save it inside a variable named app underscore CTX. Then we have to push the context by calling the push method as app underscore CTX dot push. Now, if we try to get the name of this application as current underscore app dot name, it will return the name. And the same thing for the request context. I'll import requests from the flask. And if I try to access a member of the request class like request.url, it will raise a similar error we saw before because it is required an HTTP request to push the context. Great. Let's move to the request dispatching. When the application receives a request from a client, it needs to find out what view function to invoke to service this request. For this task, Flask looks up the URL given in the request in the application's URL map, which contains a mapping of URLs to the view functions that handle them. Flask builds this map using the data provided in the app.route decorator. To see what the URL map in a Flask application looks like, you can inspect the map created for our app.py in the Python interpreter. Before you try this, make sure that your virtual environment is activated. Then inside the Python shell, import your app, then access its URL underscore map property. The slash and slash name routes were defined by the app.route decorators in the application. The slash static slash file name route is a special route added by Flask to give access to the static files. While the head, options, get, elements shown in the URL map are the request methods that are handled by the routes. The HTTP specification defines that all requests are issued with a method, which normally indicates what action the client is asking the server to perform. Flask attaches methods to each route so that different request methods sent to the same URL can be handled by different view functions. Later in this video series, we will talk about how to create routes with different HTTP methods. Great. Now, let's talk about the actual request object. You have seen that Flask exposes a request object as a context variable named request. This is an extremely useful object that contains all the information that the client included in the HTTP request. So Flask provides us various attributes and methods to get several pieces of information the client sent with the request. Here are some of the methods available for request object. The first method is get underscore data. It will return the buffered data from the request body. Then we have get underscore JSON. It will return a Python dictionary with the parsed JSON included in the body of the request. And another one is is underscore secure. It returns true if the request came through a secure HTTPS connection. And here are the some of the important variables available through the request object. Endpoint. The name of the Flask endpoint that is handling the request. Flask uses the name of the view function as the endpoint name for a route. The second one is the method. It gives the HTTP request method such as get or post. Then we have the host. The host defined in the request, including the port number if given by the client. Then we have the URL, the complete URL requested by the client, and base underscore URL same as URL but without the query string component. And another one is environ, the raw WSGI environment dictionary for the request. Great. Another important thing to know is the request hooks. Sometimes it is useful to execute code before or after each request is proceeded. For example, at the start of each request, it may be necessary to create a database connection or authenticate the user making the request. Instead of duplicating the code that performs these actions in every view function, Flask 
gives you the option to register common functions to be invoked before or after a request is dispatched. Request hooks are implemented as decorators. These are the four hooks supported by Flask. The first one is before underscore request. It registers a function to run before each request. And the second one is before underscore first underscore request. It registers a function to run only before the first request is handled. This can be a convenient way to add server initialization tasks. The next one is after underscore request. It registers a function to run after each request, but only if no unhandled exceptions occurred. The next one is tear down underscore request. It registers a function to run after each request, even if unhandled exceptions occurred. A common pattern to share data between request hook functions and view functions is to use the G context global as storage. For example, a before underscore request handler can load the logged in user from the database and store it in G that user. Later when the view function is invoked, it can retrieve the user from there. Awesome. We learned a lot. There is the last piece of this puzzle, which is very important to learn, and that's the response. When Flask invokes a view function, it expects its return value to be the response to the request. Mostly, it's a simple string in the form of an HTML page. But the HTTP protocol requires more than a string as a response to a request. A very important part of the HTTP response is the status code, which Flask by default sets to 200. The code that indicates the request was carried out successfully. When a view function needs to respond with a different status code, it can add the numeric code as a second return value after the response text. Responses returned by view functions can also take a third argument, a dictionary of headers that are added to the HTTP response. Instead of returning one, two, or three values as a tuple, Flask view functions have the option of returning a response object. The make underscore response function takes one, two, or three arguments, the same values that can be returned from a view function, and returns an equivalent response object. Sometimes it is useful to generate the response object inside the view function, then use its methods to further configure the response. The response object also provides some methods and variables. You can see here we have four different methods available for the response object. The first one is a set underscore cookie. It adds a cookie to the response. The second one we have delete underscore cookie. It will remove the cookie from the response. The next one we have is a set underscore data. It will set the response body as a string or by its value. And the last method we have is get underscore data. It will get the response body. And the variables available to the response object are status underscore code which will return the numeric HTTP status code. The next one we have the headers, a dictionary-like object with all the headers that will be sent with the response. The next one we have is a content underscore length. It will provide us the length of the response body. And another one is content underscore type. It is actually the media type of the response body which we are going to return back. But there is a special type of response called redirect. This response doesn't include a page document. It just gives the browser a new URL to navigate to. A very common use of redirect is when working with the web forms. Great. Now, at this stage, we have learned all the important concepts of Flask and we are ready to start building an actual REST API. So from the next video, we will start to build an API using Flask. So stay tuned. And if you like the content, thumbs up. And be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon so you will never miss any fantastic video in the future. Thanks for watching.